Good evening, everyone. Good. Welcome to Catalonia House. My name is Jennifer Velasco, and I'm the policy coordinator of the delegation of the government of Catalonia to the United Kingdom in Ireland. Quite the mouthful. Um, Catalonia House is not only home to the delegation, but is also home to our Catalan Tourist Board, our Trade and Investment Office, the Catalan Institute for Cultural Companies, and the Institute Ramon Ewan, which is our Institute of Cultural, Literature, and Language Promotion. Um, our representative, Frances Claret, couldn't be here this evening, so he sends his apologies. Um, at Catalonia House, our objective is for the Catalan diaspora, the Catalan community, our friends, our colleagues, everyone interested in Catalonia, to recognize us as the focal point of all things Catalonia. From tourism, to business, to innovation, to culture. In this vein, we created what we call Professor Font is Professor at the University of Surrey in Sustainability Marketing. Um, so past, present, research on sustainable tourism, so there's really no one better to have here today. So we are delighted, thank you very much. Um, so speakers will deliver their presentations, then we will open the floor for questions. So make sure to write down those questions, either mentally or figuratively or literally. Um, I won't extend much longer, just a couple of housekeeping points from us. Um, you will have seen the sign coming up the stairs. We are being filmed and we are being photographed, um, but we're not live streamed. So the recording will be available in the coming days on our YouTube channel um, and then social media coverage on the night. Toilets outside to your right. And then just as a last point, if when you come out, you wanna sign up to our contacts list, you have the sheet available and um, we will inform you of our future events as this one. So thank you very much everyone again for attending and I can, I believe the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, thank you very much uh, to the delegation to give us the opportunity to talk about, uh, about tourism. Sustainable tourism, but uh, uh, tourism, as uh, we were talking, a very important. Sorry. Well, okay, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, the first thing I was going to explain is that uh, for us, for the people who work at the tourism board, uh, we don't get used to do this kind of uh, presentations, conversations. Uh, we are not used to do uh, presentations to explain how, be how beautiful, how many things has our destination, uh, everything you can do in Catalonia to convince a trade, media, final consumer about the possibilities to discover the destination. So for us, it's a, a different way and always interesting to explain how we do our uh, work. Thank you as well for starting to Xavier, a very good friend we have met long, uh, some years ago. Uh, for us, his work is a reference for and a, and a, and a vision to understand that yes, maybe our objective is to bring to this to to, to Catalonia, but uh, as you will see during our presentation, uh, it's changing that we can bring tourists, but uh, certain type of uh, tourists or uh, certain people that give other benefits and people like Xavier help us with that work to understand how to do. Uh, our work better. Uh, again, when we do presentations, if it's on the tourism sector, there are things that we don't need to explain because each other we understand. But if there is people uh, from different sectors, uh, maybe we need to start a little bit uh, from the beginning and to know what the tourism board is doing. Of course, to this board, to these offices, you have been there, you have been looking for the information in order to in order to go on holidays, trips, anywhere in the world. Perfect. 
we do our job, we explain to you the things that you can find in the destinations. But some destinations that nowadays sell a tourist board are changing from being a tourist board to being a DMMO. DMMO meaning management and marketing. There was a step in between. That was DMO, <laughs> Destination Marketing Organization, because apart from doing the promotion, we were doing the marketing of the destination. But we realized after the pandemic that uh, apart from the marketing, what people expect from us is the management of the tourism, the tourists that they arrive into our destination. So now I'm not sure which O it's the most I which M it's the most uh, important. If the management or the marketing or both together. Because uh, if we don't do a good management, maybe the marketing will won't help us. Or if we can do a very good marketing, but if there is no management, uh, maybe uh, we will need some extra help. Anyway, destination, Catalonia, and organization, yes, are really important. But how we, uh, apart from the marketing and for our, how can we put that? We go at the end, okay, perfect. So how we do our management of the destination, because the marketing, if you want, we do another <laughs> presentation that we explain how beautiful it's Catalonia. So we go to the end. And in June 2021, the Catalan Tourism Board created the purpose. And after long talks and considering what the tourism uh, give to the, our destination, to Catalonia, we came to our purpose that now it's our main, always when we do something, we always think in that, contributing to the well-being of the community through the values of travel, contributing home, not just economically, but socially and also well, with everything, cultural interchange and anything that people can give in between uh, us whenever you move or go to uh, one place. Well-being, what does it mean for us the well-being? In fact, it's not just well-being economically, so have the money to spend and to uh, consider uh, to be able to, to, to have facilities, but the personal well-being as well. And the well-being of the people who is living there, and the, the well-being of the people who is living in touristic destinations, but also the ones that are living beyond the coast or beyond the city, the cities, and they are able to keep living there thanks to the tourists or the people who come. Community, who is the community? For us, is everybody. The tourists, the residents, the people who visit, the password, the passers, the, the, anybody is the community. Not just uh, the people who live on the place. Once you go uh, on holiday or business trip uh, to a place, during these hours, days, weeks that you are in the place, you form part of, of the community. And at the same time, you are consuming uh, in the restaurants that the community knows, or you are going through the streets that the community is using. So you are using the services that everybody is using. So I will say that almost everybody is tourist or community, uh, and always at the same time. You are community where you live, but once you are tourist and you go to a place, you will be as well the community. At the end of the purpose, the values of travel. Of course, as I said before, uh, travel, the interchange of people give cultural resources and uh, cultural facilities that uh, this uh, helps us to, uh, to interchange these uh, values. So having that, uh, that sentence, uh, that purpose, and we'll try to go to the beginning. 
perfect. So now second one. So, in June 2021, we created the, our forum post. In the March 2023, last year, Catalonia, the uh, Catalan Tourist World, launched the, well, launched, presented to the sector our uh, national co commitment uh, to responsible tourism. This is a tool that we provided to all the tourism sector in Catalonia uh, that give us or help us to drive the path to the tourism that uh, we want for our destination. Uh, we understand that after the pandemic, Catalonia uh, is of the Catalan tourism of the people who visit Catalonia is probably in a crossroad. So we are in the moment to go, to choose. If we want to keep growing as we were before the pandemic, receiving as many tourists and as many visitors uh, every year more and more as we were before the pandemic, or we choose to uh, to stop and to say which kind of tourists we want to receive, what they need to offer to the destination to be considered good for the community. So, as you know, Catalonia, apart from being a tourism destination, is also uh, an agricultural area, an industrial country, a logistic center, a place that, uh, that uh, by its magnet for talent, so, so many things on the same place, but as well, a tourist destination. So, tourism, as uh, our uh, general director used to say, it's a uh, it's not everything, but it's everywhere. Or at least the translation uh, that uh, she always explains in all the uh, presentations. Meaning that not everything is tourism, but tourism could be uh, everywhere. So, uh, what that uh, national commitment to responsible tourism explains? That's a document that has been signed for more than 200 uh, entities and associations of uh, the tourism sector in Catalonia, including from accommodation uh, associations, of hotels, campsites, uh, apartments, including as well uh, guides, uh, associations of guides, travel agents, restaurants. So everybody who is in the path of a tourist has agreed in Catalonia to uh, consider the national commitment to responsible tourism as the path to, uh, to, to, to reach the objective uh, that we are trying to, to, to have as a, as, as a destination. And these are divided in three different uh, upper sections. Okay? That's it. 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 So there are, it's divided in three different parts. The video environmentally sustainable tourism, of course, uh, everything that you do. Will give a, will have a carbon carbon footprint, or every time that you move, there's a carbon footprint, even if you are not tourist. But uh, for us, it's important that uh, the way that the tourists arrive, it's the most it gives the most lower uh, carbon footprint, meaning that uh, doing a trip for one day, maybe the cost that you generate in carbon footprint, it's too expensive to the, the, the profit that you generate at the destination. So if you are arriving from a long haul trip, you will generate lots of carbon footprint, so maybe you need to stay longer at the destination to uh, give the opportunity to, uh, to settle down. 
The other one will be the socially just tourism. As uh, I said at the beginning, not just environmentally or economically uh, uh, tourism, it's important, but also socially, meaning that if you want to live in a small town up in the mountain, you will need to be able to keep living there. You don't need to go to the city for work or for services. And to reach this, uh, one of the aspects that we are, are trying to explain is that what uh, that the tourists that come to see you needs to give you a benefit to allow you to uh, stay there. This helps us as well to split tourism on the destination and to split the benefits of the tourism. And uh, this is related to the third point, the territorial balance in tourism. Uh, as you know, Catalonia has uh, more part of the tourism that arrive in Catalonia is concentrated in the coast, so meaning Barcelona, the city of Barcelona, Costa Brava, Costa del Gal. Uh, the rest of the inland destination, including the Pyrenees, maybe it's the less visited. If we are able to know that we have uh, the hook of Barcelona or the hook of the coast and the, and the good weather to attract tourism from all over Europe and all over the, uh, the world, but we can have that hook to split the tourism and to explain that beyond that there's something else, it will, it will help us to give an answer to the first and the second point. And to, ex to try to do that, during the pandemic, we have created uh, a product. This will be more easy for us to explain because that's something that we share with the tourism sector. Uh, during the, the pandemic, we thought that uh, uh, we needed to move all the tourists from the coast inland or the ones that are in the coast to have the opportunity to discover what they have inland. And that's why we created, inspired by the Switzerland Tourism Board, the Grand Tour of Catalonia. That's a circular road trip that uh, uh, highlights the 72 most important places to visit in Catalonia, covering in different areas. But for us, it's the way to obtain the four Ds. Here you have uh, the information, the, the concentration, so split the tourism, the deseasonalization, meaning that uh, tourists can arrive in Catalonia in different seasons. So we have the peak seasons of June, July, August. And uh, if we offer them uh, to discover other parts of the destination, maybe they are able to come in the lower season. Diversification of the products, not just cultural destination or sand of beach destination. We can offer active tourism, gastronomical, white tourism, different proposals in land. And the third, the fourth one, that's in Catalan, it's D, that's Tesla, that's why the fourth is, it's increase the spending, the expenditure of the tourists that arrive to Catalonia. If they give us more book, they spend more money in the destination, there will be more people and more different uh, services getting that, uh, that uh, these benefits. Uh, how, just to finish, we uh, try to mix that culture of Catalonia with the sustainable tourism. For us, it's important that uh, tourism will be sustainable or won't be, because uh, in fact, we are going to grow in numbers of tourism, tourist visits every year, even if we do the Grand Tour or don't do the Grand Tour. Every time, uh, we are in a world that the tourism has been uh, facilitated to everyone, and that's good, but we need to be able to uh, to, to encourage people to learn how to use these benefits. And uh, for us, the sustainable uh, proposals uh, meet 
what, what we have in saying that the benefits need to reach all the testing measures. But now I think Xavier will give us like uh, the other side of the uh, we, we are the government, the tourism world. Then we are going to see the side of what tourists are uh, doing in different destinations. Very good at doing the devil's advocate job. That seems to be my presentation. Um, like Carl was saying, we don't know if we become into destination management or marketing organization, which one is more important. I would just say, follow the money. Look at what percentage of your budget you spend on marketing, what percentage you spend on management, and that tells you who you are. And I think that will tell you you're still marketing, like 95%. If you look at the number of jobs in the um, tourist board that are marketing jobs and the number of people that have in their job title sustainability or management, that tells you wh what you are. Yeah? So we lie to ourselves beautifully, right? In the same way I can lie to myself, I can eat chocolate and be fit and get healthy, right? And I can quite happily do that while I'm eating chips and drinking beer and say, I'm going to get healthy tomorrow. But today, I like my chips, okay? So let us have some basic principles of sustainable tourism. You may not like all of it, but here it is. And, uh, you know, with apologies to bear who've seen this in class. This is what I teach first year students at university. What's surprising to me is that people who are 50 years old and have been in the industry for a long time still haven't understood it. But here we are. I'm hoping that by teaching it to 19 year olds, there is a future for all of us. Booking.com tells us everybody loves sustainable tourism. Bullshit. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely bullshit. Because we ask questions that are biased. The way we ask the question is, like I say, Ewan, are you a good son? Strongly agree to strongly disagree. What will you say? Of course you'll say yes. If I ask you mom, she may say something different. But the question is worded in a way that we wanted it to say the answer, yes, everybody loves it. The reality is not that. The reality is quite different. Right? The reality is the businesses that at the moment are able to claim because they're able to be certified that I have done the homework, the unsustainable, look like that. Where would you say that hotel room is? Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. <laughs> I mean, can you see how it screams Malaysia? Yeah? What is wrong with us? Right? So, the work I do for Booking.com, we collected data from 1.6 million properties across the world on their sustainability practices, and we found that the properties that are most able to claim that they're sustainable are corporate franchise hotels that are large, that are well managed, where there is good customer satisfaction where people pay high prices, essentially, they're just big hotels, they corporate hotels. Because there is expectation that the bigger you are, the more reputational risk there is from not being able to be seen as being sustainable. And nobody likes corporate reputational risks. Yeah? So that's what we're doing. But the photos, my God, we need investment on photos to say sustainable. And the thing is very, very easy to take photos of unsustainable, Right? We've all seen some of those. But photo sustainable, you look at it and you say, that just looks normal. That, that looks like the kind of place I want to go to. Right? So, so we have a lot of work. And also the sustainable hotels, like a sustainable airlines and so on, don't provide tangible customer benefits. Unless you stay in a few places that look like that. Now, in my mind, when I want a sustainable hotel, it's got that view. Yeah? And I'm definitely willing to pay for that, okay? So the challenge that we've got, and something I say to every tourist destination, every business is, invest in good photography. If I say to you the word butterfly, every one of you has a mental picture of what the butterfly looks like. None of you did B, U, T, T, right? But if I say to you the word sustainable, do you have a mental picture? No, you don't. So, for emotional terms, you're using a different half of your brain than for rational words. And holiday decisions are emotional connections. They're not rational connections. Okay? 
So I'm asking you to use the wrong side of the brain to take a decision that's going to be then taken by the other half of the brain. I'm not a neurologist, you know, I'm not into neuroscience, but the two things turn out that very well. Okay? So we have to find, if we generally went to sell sustainable tourism, it has to speak to the customers. It has to be something the customers want to do. Every time we want tourists to say, let's choose a sustainable option, we are implicitly saying to them, do something that competes with what you perceive is quality, price, location, convenience, novelty, risk. For most of us, we tend to see sustainability as a trade-off against any one of those. Very few destinations, very few businesses are able to say sustainability contributes to quality. Sustainability reduces the price that you have to pay, not increases the price. Sustainability gives you a better location. You're able to see and do things that others couldn't do. We did an experiment at uni where we gave people five different coffee cups and we showed them five brands of coffee. And we said to them, tell me which coffee is which brand. It's an impossible exercise. But the reason for that was one of the coffees was fair trade, sustainable, organic. Every person that tried the coffees believed that the coffee they liked the least should be the fair trade organic coffee. Right? In our mind, we are wired to believe that if something is good for you, it will not taste as good. Right? Whereas the food that is bad for you tastes better. Yeah? Think about it yourselves. Right? What you enjoy eating. Like, I like my salads, but boy, sometimes, you know, like chocolate tastes better than salad, let's be honest. And however much you like salad. Okay? So, a lot of my work has been looking at the concept of green hushing. You know, I know some of you are bored before to tears with that, okay? Team amongst others. But green hushing essentially means not speaking loudly about your sustainability practices because customers fear that what you're going to tell them is going to be boring and is going to be a compromise. Equally, a lot of my work has been around greenwashing. And greenwashing, we all know quite well, right? And I love the, you know, have you seen the brandalism campaigns recently? you know, against particularly airlines, absolutely brilliant attempts of impacting negatively on the brand of big companies. So this one is on Lufthansa, you know, say yes to the end of the world, and Lufthansa will distract you with pictures of trees while we fry the planet. And clearly it's not exclusive to Lufthansa, we've seen those for KLM and, you know, all sorts of other airlines. Right? And the idea is you've got posters on the street, but really what makes the big news is what happens then in social media and all the conversations you get on the back of that. So at some point I looked at all these hotel groups and we found out that at least 25% of the things they said on their website never happened in reality. Right? And that's just the beginning of it. Right? We found one hotel that when you started to work there as a member of staff, on the day of arrival, they made you sign your employment letter and they made you sign your resignation letter. But the resignation letter was undated. And when they wanted to sack you, they just put a date to your resignation letter. And they showed it to you and said, look, you just resigned today. Bye. It's certainly illegal, definitely immoral. It's happening. Okay, And it's happening closer to home than you believe. I'm not going to tell you who. Right? That's not the presentation, and clearly I'm being recorded, so why would I say it? Okay? Um, I did some work for the United Nations a while ago, and we looked at the 50 largest hotel groups in the world, and we looked at which ones of them have good corporate social responsibility programs. This is data from 2018. I've done the analysis in 2014, 2018, in 2022, and we're now doing the comparison of three different points in time. You will not believe the number of reports that year after year talk about we are beginning. And they were beginning in 2014, and they were beginning in 2018, and you can see where I'm going with it, they were still beginning in 2022. Of the 50 largest hotel groups in the world, only 20 of them produce corporate social responsibility reports. This is not enough. Right? Think some of them are your members. Right? I mean, besides the fact you can see, I don't know how to spell Wyndham, what we can also learn from this graph is we looked at how many of them actually, as the stakeholders, what should we do? 
because it's a lot easier to do what you want to do without asking stakeholders what you should be doing. But that's not right. That's like me defining what makes me a good husband without asking my wife. Right? Oh, I could be a really good husband on that basis if I only consider what I think is a good husband as opposed to asking the person at your end. Yeah. And then the other one, materiality, is do you actually respond to your customer wants? And then, of course, there's a third piece, which is, you know, do you actually demonstrate to your customer, look, you asked me to do five things, I've done three, but in my to-do list, there are the other two that I haven't even started, but in my report, I will be honest, and I will put them in the list, even because they make me look bad, but they are in my to-do list, and I need to be honest about this. We tend to not do that. Ah, oh, I love this one. And I did this presentation not that long ago in Canada, online, by the way. And of course, Air Canada came up as the single worst airline in the world for greenwashing. You can imagine the comments. Right? How can this be? Right? It can be very, very easily. 37 airlines in the world out of 116 offer voluntary carbon offsetting. That has gone down, not up. From 2016, we used to have 41. So, unless you think that voluntary carbon offsetting is a bad thing, that the direction of travel is wrong. Okay? And then what we found is nearly 50% of every single message written by every single airline in the world is misleading and cannot be trusted. Now, obviously, every message can, was analyzed again, seven or eight different criteria, every single sentence. I mean, academics, we are real nerds, okay? We like analyzing every sentence or every single website. That's what we do in our spec time. But the analysis here basically showed that some of the best airlines, like Thai Airways, they're not great because their messages are brilliant. They're great because they say very little, right? But then you've got companies like Air New Zealand and United Airlines that are very, very good because they say a lot, and they're also very honest about it. And then we've got companies at the top end, like Air Canada and Alaska and Ryanair, which are just genuinely misleading, and very deliberately so. Right? They're giving you the impression that you give two euros to plant a couple of trees somewhere, and you can now fly guilt-free to Barcelona or to somewhere else. And you think, ah, but the industry associations are much, much better than that. Right? Bullshit. Industry associations protect their members. Right? Big part of their job is to protect their revenue, and the revenue comes from membership fees. In uh, relation to animal welfare, I want to do some work on animal welfare, because I think most of us, we don't know what a ton of carbon looks like. And let's face it, a ton of carbon is not cute but an elephant or a dolphin is. Right? So it's much easier to have an emotional connection with, I don't know, a, a baby tiger than it is to have with a ton of carbon. So we looked at, of 62 tour, tour operator associations in the world, how many of them talk about animal welfare? The answer is, well, look, 21 of the 62 talk about sustainable tourism. So that itself is worrying, because destinations like Peru, Ecuador, when you're thinking, Peru has got the highest biodiversity in the world. The tour operator association never speaks about sustainability. Ecuador, come on, you've got the Galapagos. It doesn't speak about sustainability. And it certainly does not ask their members, the tour operators, to do anything for sustainability. So we go from 21 that speak about sustainability to six that talk about animal welfare. You're thinking, hang on a minute, how can Tour operators that go to the Galapagos Islands not talk about animal welfare. How can Uganda, where tour operators are going to see the gorillas, not talk about animal welfare? And so on. Okay? Three of them have actual animal welfare programs, and only one of them, the Dutch Tour Operators Association, likely monitors what the members do. Now, to me, this is just rubbish. You know, tour operators are selling excursions that promote animal cruelty, and the association that they're members of know this is happening and are doing very, very little about it. And to me, industry associations should be ashamed for not doing more. You may think, ah, the government will come and save the day. I don't think so, at least not in Europe. I mean, if it's not happening in Europe, certainly it'll happen somewhere else, right? 
This is showing you 2020-2023 data. We would hope that post-COVID we all had an epiphany, right? And we saw the light. It sounds like Catalonia did until you look at the breakdown of what actually is happening. Yeah? Sorry, you knew it was coming. Yeah. So you, you invited me. So if you look at it, like 90% of government plans say sustainability is really important to us. And they normally say it where? In the CEO statement in the first page. And then you look at the actual report and there's very little about it. Right? Because then talk about green transformation, but in big words, is mentioned but only by 50%. Climate change, look, we went from sustainability mentioned by 90% to climate change mentioned by 35%. Right? Measuring, looking for carbon neutrality. Okay, we've got now to 20%. But you know how many of the actual plans that I've looked at talk about key performance indicators that will be measurable for sustainability? 2%. How did we go from 90% of your policy saying sustainability is important to 2% of the 101 national tourism strategies I have analyzed having actual measurable key performance indicators? I could get dig deeper. I could then say, well, how many of those actions have actually have reasonable budgets to be able to meet the actions? Well, Budgets are not disclosed. Yeah? So we have a long way to go. So what should we be doing? What's the homework here? First thing, the EU is setting the agenda, right? We're just not listening hard enough. What was the, I was the consultant that did the transition pathway for tourism. Tim, you were in the, the meetings. We had a good you know, fun there until the lawyers from the airlines and the cruise lines turned up. And then they dismantled half of what was going to be there. And then beyond that, what we did is we come up with a massive report that we presented to the Commission. The Commission said, right, we're now going to send it to the Ministries of Environment for every European member state and the equivalent of the Ministries of Tourism for every member state. And you know what came back? Every minister had the right to delete parts of my report and say, everything that essentially you are saying the government should do, we're deleting it. We're only going to leave there the part that industry is supposed to do. But we left the targets the same. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute. You're asking me to box with one hand, not with both hands. Because you've just removed 50% of the tools, at least of what we'll be able to do. And many of the things that the private sector was supposed to do could only really happen if the private sector, sorry, if the, if the public sector was going to be supporting it. Okay? And that is not happening. And that's really not fair. Now, I'm not going to talk about all the legislation because we haven't really got the time. But a key performance indicator that every government should have, including Catalonia, is what percentage of my tourism services are certified as sustainable. And at the moment, the percentage is amazing in Copenhagen, in Gothenburg, in Belfast, curiously, is not in Barcelona. Belfast has gone from 5% of all the hotel beds being certified as sustainable to 80% in two years. Where's Barcelona? Yeah, about 5%. Right? We need to incentivize. We need to create a system where we say it's going to happen. How did Copenhagen do it? They said, if you want to be part of the supply chain for business tourism, for conferences, for conventions, you need to be certified. Otherwise, we will not put you in the list of what would be the equivalent of the preferred hotels for any of our conventions, conferences, events. Can you see the Catalan Tourist Board, the Convention Center doing this? Because, boy, I've been to the FIDA in the Barcelona, I've been to the Convention Bureau, and so on, and I've told them year after year, it's like, yeah, 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 it's in the list, it's in the plan. It has never happened. Like, we need to get bold and actually have some teeth. So, so we need to work on that. Second thing we need to do. Some tourists have a much bigger carbon footprint than others. This morning I showed this slide to 171 regional tourist boards from Spain. The presentation was online. Okay? They, were, they all decided to fly to Tenerife, the Canary Islands, the furthest point in Spain, to talk about sustainability. 
And then when I told them you need to reduce your carbon footprint, they said, no, no, we can't possibly do that. And I'm like, what are we doing? Right? So this is the graph for Barcelona. Right? I, I, I chose to show you the graph that's closest to home to you. And you can see Spanish tourists have the lowest carbon footprint, but also the lowest expenditure. And the bubble is big because the market is big. But we need to start measuring why we like tourists, not just basically on the vertical, how much they spend, but on the combination of the vertical and the horizontal. Right? Only focusing on the vertical alone is like you managing your bank account by looking at the money coming into your bank account, but not looking at the money coming out of your bank account. And I can guarantee you, if you analyze only the money that comes in and not the money that comes out of your bank account, every one of you would be bankrupt. Right? Why do we do it in tourism? Because the money coming out is paid by somebody else, which in this case is the local community and the planet. Yeah? That's why all of our plans just focus on this vertical. Our key performance indicator is always make more money, bring more tourists. Our key performance indicator is never even the balance between the two. Let's target the market where we have the highest expenditure for the lowest possible carbon footprint. And when I showed this graph to Tourist Spain, the Spanish tourist board, they said, well, are you suggesting we should close the office in Mexico? Because you know what, tourists will still come from Mexico anyway. And my answer, they fell into my trap 100%. Because my answer was, well, if the tourists from Mexico will come anyway, you should definitely close the office in Mexico. Because you've just proven to me that your job is redundant. You are not needed. And it's, oh, you're just twisting my words. No, I'm not twisting your words. It's just that your arguments are really, really poor. So for Andalusia, the south of Spain, we came up with a much more complex set of criteria. The thing you saw is not that long ago. And we said to them, I know expenditure is not the only thing that matters to you. We now create a dashboard for you that says, are you a leader for that market? Is that market dynamic, which means has it recovered from the numbers from before COVID? Is that market a seasonal market or not? Is that market a long month of stay or not? Is that market a high expenditure or low expenditure? Is that market well connected to my destination? Eckhart, how many of your criteria is this meeting? Quite a few. Yeah? And then I gave you three more criteria that you may not like. Carbon footprint in total, carbon footprint per guest night, and the, the average carbon footprint you know, per euro spent in the destination. And I'm not saying you should take destination decisions based on only the last three columns. I'm saying you need to do a mixture of those three columns with the previous columns. And ideally, now I'm doing work at adding more columns about residents' perceptions of tourism. Do residents, I'm not saying do residents like Germans more than they like French, because that's not going to work. I can imagine the newspapers really enjoying the day when we publish a story like that. Right? Enjoying it for the wrong reasons. But certainly, do residents enjoy more the type of tourists that stay in apartments than the people who stay in hotels? Do they like more the people who come for football events than the people who come for cultural events? Do they like the tourists that have short stays or come with families compared to tourists that come on cruises and so on? And if we are genuinely saying, my purpose is to bring tourists to improve the quality of life of residents, and residents should be first, then we have to listen to our residents. Okay? So we need that impact assessment of local residents, and that has to happen. What is the Spanish Tourist Board doing? They're saying we're going to do a survey of people across the whole of Spain, whether residents from the whole of Spain like tourism or not. What a stupid thing to do. Okay? So I'll give you a joke that you've probably heard before. There's a drunk man that in the middle of the night is looking for his keys under a lamp in the street. Have you heard this joke before? Okay, so I'll continue. And somebody else comes along and says, what are you looking for? My keys. Ah, where did you lose them? Over there. Why are you looking here? Well, there's a light here. There's no light over there. You're not going to find the keys that way, are you? What we are doing as industry very often is just that, right? We want to hear a certain answer 
and we will ask the questions that will give us the answer that we wanted to hear. Not the answer that is uncomfortable. We have to reduce seasonality. I have some new manuals on this. They are in English and in French. And I've offered to the Catalan Tourist Board, free of charge, you can translate them into Catalan. There is no cost to you. We publish them with a Creative Commons license, so they could be translated by anybody in any language, because essentially we use European taxpayers' money to produce the materials. So it should be available for anybody to use. So if you guys want to use them, do it. I deliver training on this for uh, the Puerto Rico Barcelona from time to time. And then my best example I've always, always loved is the 50 things to do before you are 11 and 3 quarters, which is an example used by National Trust as a way of getting families to act more sustainably. Only it's not sold as be more sustainable. What I love about it is if you look at the list, to be an adventure, you can climb a tree, you can roll down a really big hill, you can camp out in the wild. What's the carbon footprint of any one of those things? Zero. Actually, what is the cost of any one of those things? Zero. And let's face it, we talk about COVID, but the big problem now is the economic crisis that we have. People don't have money. But I know we want people to spend more, but you know what? People that have no money still are entitled, they still have the moral and social right to enjoy their holidays. I don't want to be in a tourist destination that says, you're only welcome in Catalonia if you're rich. And if you're poor, go somewhere else. What kind of society are we going to be if that's the message that we are sending? Right? So let's provide activities for people who don't want to spend the money, or even more importantly, for parents and kids that want to talk to one another instead of looking at their mobile phones. And they will do things together. What the National Trust does, does is if you do 10 of those things, the discover ones, it gives you the most important thing in the world for a six-year-old, a sticker that says, I am a discoverer. And it's super cool and you're gonna wear it with pride until it peels off because it no longer has any stick, right? And if you do all 50, then they'll give you a prize. I did this a training to businesses in Catalonia showing them this, and one of the businesses copied it, he's in the Pyrenees, and he says, I'm doing this, and now, 10 of those things you can only do in spring, 10 of them you can only do them in autumn, because they've got marketing Christmas, you know, winter, because of the ski and so on. And David, the guy from this business, uh, from Sarvania Resort, if you know them, okay, he's, he's amazing. Yeah. And he said to me, if you do all 50, I give those families a weekend for free in a teepee or a yurt in our property. And I said, David, that's super generous. And he said, it's not generous at all. The families that do this are the wholesome families I want to have in my, in my house. Those are the families that is a pleasure. Like, th these kind of people are the reason why I went into tourism. And I love having them in, in my place. Besides which, they do amazing marketing for me. They bring me really nice customers. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, as mentioned, we will open the floor to questions. So, I don't know if Tim, your name has been mentioned a couple times or more, if you want to get us started. When, when, <laughs> yeah, when, when I put the slide on um, in the association, it wasn't targeting you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, um, sure. Uh, well, so I, for people who don't know who I am, um, it's for the recording. Yeah, it's just the recording. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear you? All right. I'll just whisper. <laughs> uh, so I work for something called the European Tourism Association, or ETOA. Um, so that is, um, depending on who I'm talking to, I might say it's a speed dating agency for the travel industry. So if you're a hotel and you're looking for clients, we might have the clients inside our network. If you're an operator based in California and you're looking for new experiences for your clients in in northeastern Spain or Catalonia, however you're describing it, then it Ouch. could be <laughs> a Californian. They don't necessarily know. Yeah, absolutely. So, but you know, joking apart. So let, let's suppose uh, someone's doing pilgrimage tours and they want to go on the Camino. They need some, you know, someone's local expertise then that's probably in our network as well. So they can focus on selling their programs and designing them in California and they get Europeans to 
put it together. Um, we also have about, and the interesting thing is, a hundred regional and local DMMOs, and I'm going to get back to that because I think the spectrum is really interesting, and 20-something national ones, and the rest supply chain. So, so we're, we're quite broad, little businesses, absolutely some of those uh, hotel brands that Chevier mentioned, uh, part of the membership, and, and I recognize a lot of both the green hushing and the green washing uh, that was described, and I follow a bit of the climate litigation as well, so I get that it's interesting that <coughs> particularly in the uh, EU transition pathway, which is, I mean, I think one of the one of the reasons why the very frustrating process you describe takes place, that, you know, get, um, well, lobbyists do what lobbyists do, but the national piece where <coughs> each, each, each member state gets to put a line through stuff that's inconvenient is that tourism sits at a, at a national level from an EU perspective. So the European Commission doesn't have any competence in, in tourism. Um, the extent to which tourism is there is in the tourism unit. And there's a very big irony at the moment in that the reason why the exercise that Trevier and I were involved in late summer <coughs> took place was people realised that without the visitor economy, a lot of Europe was in economic difficulty because it has an impact across the whole service sector. So it's not just hotels, it's retail, it's restaurants, it's what have you. And because it's very fragmented, it's very SME micro-dominated, what, what, what do you do? So let's have an in industry plan. Um, and that's sort of what this was. And it can't really bear the weight of expectation because it's, it's 27 topics which are all useful for, for, for making plans, but um, there's a really jealous guardianship of what tourism management is, and, and the fact is that if you closed the door and you weren't recording, and you had a group of people who represent national tourism organisations, there'd be a very big spectrum of what does success look like. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, would, would be very sympathetic to the messages we've heard just now. Others would go, forget it, is the money going up? Done, next topic. Uh, that's true also of some regions, also of some destinations. I think your example of Copenhagen, I've got a feeling City DNA are very instrumental in that because there is a very pragmatic reason why you want to be a good destination for conferences and so forth, because when they're happy with the location, they tend to stay. So it's, it's very good repeat business if you talk to someone like Brussels, 55% of the hotel stock. It's not from leisure, it's from meetings and what have you, Paris, about 50%. So get that right, you know, you, you make things very happy. But I spoke, my, my, not challenges back, but questions. That the Mexican representation for the, it was the Spain, it was the Spain national, yeah. Um, I was having a chat with another Southern European National Tourism Organization <laughs> recently. Um, and I was asking the same question. I said, apart from the fact it's really cool you get to live in New York and have lunch often with lots of people, and that, that's really the job. Yeah. Um, what's the point in having an office in New York? Because, surprise, surprise, people from America will go and visit the country in question. Um, and I said, well, isn't, isn't the job therefore more influence? And I know it's a marketing versus influence and they blur. But what seems to me to be the opportunity and the, the chance to redefine is if you are going to throw public money at this network of people, what's the point in them? And influencing product and influencing behavior feel like two of the big opportunities which people talk about a lot. But when you are analysing what do people in that organisation do, so I suppose my question is, those mechanisms are not going to dismantle overnight. How do you, how can we sell the idea of repurposing them so they influence what people do when they get to Europe <coughs> and how it, how it gets sold? So it's not promotion; it's more influencing. Any thoughts on I that? I think the DMMO question will kind of redirect nicely over there, and then I'll follow up after. Yeah. 
Perfect. Thank you very much for that question. The Catalan Tourism Board has 12 offices around the world in the 12 key markets, covering the uh, markets that or they uh, send more tourists to Catalonia or they provide the, this high quality tourists tourist that doesn't mean expensive that they do so but that they they use the five star hotels let's say just so uh, in these 12 offices yes we have a marketing action plan to promote the destination but our main objective is by this uh, uh, to, to get information of the market, marketing <coughs> intelligence. These we use to explain to our offer what we need to do to provide the correct product for uh, that. And, uh, and uh, uh, yes, we do the promotion, we do that marketing. Uh, and what we are going to say is that at the Catalan Tourism Board, every time now we are using less how many tourists they arrive, but how important are these tourists? For example, in our case, we use the UK, uh, we cover the UK and uh, uh, like market. Uh, before the pandemic, there used to be a little bit more of 2 million uh, UK tourists every year coming to Catalonia. Now it's 1 million eight, something like this. Uh, last year, 2023, and this year it will be some, something similar. So we are having less UK tourists. If we put that information to the sector, they will say they, they are coming less tourists, you are doing kind of job. But if we read when they are coming down and how much they spend and where they are going, that doesn't mean that they go to the five star hotels, they are discovering new routes. This makes us feel that we are doing a good job. And the other part of the good job on that side is that local tour operators here, they are opening new programs in areas that uh, UK tourists, maybe he won't be able to reach because he don't know. They need these tour operators, normally the eight of members or this, to offer these products that they don't know in order to discover that uh, these places. Uh, when we have new programs, new trips in all these tour operators, we guess we are doing a good job of sending people out of the season, in new areas, in places where they can spend money in the hotels that they facilitate, at least. So this is our job, not uh, sending more and more and more tourists. Sure. I think Okay, we're back. Um, I think that that opens a couple of really interesting points because you, um, you know, the people who are selling those holidays are not you. It's eight members in that case. So uh, people don't know what that is. It's an association of outbound tour operators who tend to be quite niche, um, smaller operators, um, and they might be looking for quite off the beaten track staff. So I suppose. Part of my question is how you support those people. Um, did you know there was this new thing to do and these are these new? So I think it's that, I'm getting back to the influence thing, because because you, you need the private sector to do the selling and they do the marketing. And I, and I think one of the themes that keeps coming up in the dialogues I have is, you know, how can the public sector use the private sector as an instrument to deliver the type of development you want to see. So, you know, if, if that if that was the, the project, you know, you know, be manipulative. Use use the travel industry to do the thing you want. What what would that look like? I mean, that's that's the challenge to me. Um, and and it and it feels like if you can reframe what what the, what the role is, that's quite straightforward because no one's going to get offended by that. And it's a very sort of pragmatic. What's the cut? I'm going to send you. Is that right? So there's a kind of relentless common sense about that. There's a there's a sin. Yeah. So it feels like, um, in some ways, promotion. It's a bit like tourism's a dirty word. Promotion's a bit of a dirty word. But if you, if it if it is about 
that influence. Okay, what are we trying to achieve? What does good look like? So how do we use this private sector ecosystem to deliver that? Yeah, in fact, the, what the, the answer is we are here to learn what the tourists and the companies are looking to sell. And we are looking at our offer in Catalonia to see what kind, what part of this offer we can offer to the tour operators. So what we are, are in the middle, in between the interest of the tour operator who want to sell holidays and the interest of the offer who has the product there, Hotel Brillat in La Serraya, that they have this niche product and they are not looking for volume, they are looking for this type of tourist that will enjoy that uh, destination. Uh, how this offer in Catalonia can use us? We have different programs of uh, affiliation, members, different categories of products. Everyone can see, yes, I, I want to be member of the gastronomic or the cultural or whatever. They can show the product and they have a range of 12 offices in different markets that they will say, look, Maybe you don't need to go to look for Chinese people because your product fits better in the UK market. And this is our job here, to know very well each market, what they are demanding each time. And that's the importance for us of the offices. No, of course, if we are not here, the tourists will arrive to our destination. But if we are here, they will go where we one or where we can help the rest of the destination. Another thing, oh, another thing that uh, I was going to put on the table, and like this I pass the word to, to Xavier, is uh, last uh, 4th of April, Travel Weekly, the boss, uh, the magazine that uh, reaches all the travel agencies and tour operators in the UK has that, <laughs> you know, proceeds from it, that uh, piece telling that eco consent drop. 28% of consumers, they don't consider carbon footprint of their travel. It, uh, that's not surprising, I would say 98%, yeah. not yeah. 28%. Yeah. So, of course, when, when we sell holidays, or when we explain holidays, and we need to tackle the carbon footprint. But there are other things, like you said on the presentation, the price, the destination, what they offer. Thanks for being here. As we are able to say, to suggest that there are different destinations. Instead of going to that place, Try to go to Prudyaks and you will see that hotel. If this hotel works and it uh, likes, there will be other offer and the PDs that they will say, maybe we come there or maybe we follow them on the trail. Yeah. yeah, but you can't expect the customers will choose the right thing because it's the right thing, right? And even if you tell them, don't do something, like. Come on, every time one of our, somebody tells us, don't do something, what's the first thing we do? <laughs> we do it. Like, how many times you get a coffee and there's a sign that says, caution, too hot. What's the first thing you do? <laughs> you find out if it's too hot. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, so the better thing is to find, a bit like with children, rather than say, don't touch that, because then you're going to touch it, just find something else that's more interesting, more shiny, more attractive, that happens to be better for you. You know, and, and now, and, and some tourist boards say to me, Shabby, the things you're asking me to do are very difficult. And my answer is, you are getting paid with taxpayers' money. Taxpayers are not paying you to do what's easy. They're paying you to, to do what's right. I don't, don't, don't expect you know, to get a pat on the back because you did something easy. Yeah? Again, as you can imagine, I don't make many friends when they say those things. But oh, come on, guys. like Because it's, it's highly problematic. The situation we're in is not yeah. pleasant. And, the hotels in Barcelona that I'm now talking to about water, they're basically saying we're not really prepared to do anything to try to change the consumer behavior. Right? And you know, better than you've seen it on campus. We have these devices on campus in showers, in steward halls of residence, 
where when you turn the water, it tells you the number of seconds and then the number of minutes that your shower has been running. Right? And we know that by showing you the length of your shower, people shorten the shower in hotels by an average of 24 to 28%. Let, let me put you an example here. There is a hotel in Barcelona that they with a price on that sense yeah. because of the showers, they have a sun clock. Okay. That it's three or five minutes, yeah. I don't know. They put it as a clock in all yeah. the showers, all the rooms, yeah. every time that you get the shower, yeah. you put the sun clock. But and you, you, need you need to do it. You need to do it. You need to do it like this. Right. Thanks to do that, they just drop the consumption yeah. of water. So this kind of yeah. example. One. One. Got one. How many hotels do you have in Barcelona? <laughs> no, 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 no. Let me just ask the question. How many hotels do you have in Barcelona? Yeah. But, Okay. And why are we not helping helping the others to learn? Because there's new like now new legislation in Catalonia that says maximum consumption of water 100 liters per person, and if we don't behave, it's going to drop to 90. A five minute shower in a hotel consumes 40 liters of water, right? The average shower of people my age group is four minutes. The average of people your age group is 15 minutes, and that's when it's not hair days. If it's, your, <laughs> right? if it's a day to wash your hair, the shower is even longer, right? At, um, actually, curiously, the boys and girls have the same length of shower. I don't know what the boys are doing in the shower, and I don't want to know, right? But, um, but honestly, we have a massive problem when it comes to this. Like, because if, if your budget is 100 liters per day, and people are already consuming that in showers before they're flushing the toilets, before they're washing their hands, before they go to the swimming pool, before we prepare any food for them for dinner, right? So we, we and the fact that the hotels are not prepared to change their behavior, they, they're not even prepared to say, we'll put some of these signs, we'll put some, some of the clocks, nothing. I'm just thinking, where are we going? Sorry, Tim. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sure other people will have other people please say something, but I mean we had a I don't think you were there, we had a conversation last summer, a round table organized by the Travel Foundation um, in Brussels and that that you know pushes things in a useful direction. Um, and that was private sector, public sector. Um, the big takeaway for me from the private sector was that we need more regulation mm -hmm. because voluntary stuff doesn't work and there's various reasons why that one is you make more money not doing it quite often now yes being energy efficient saves you money and stuff so yes 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 but on the whole we've got to de-risk transition we were talking about it just now and Yes, you can encourage people to move before the regulator tells them to, and there's enlightened self-interest arguments, but it's a bit like food. If you say, all right, had a plenty of discussion, you cannot sell drinks with more than X percent sugar in it. End of discussion. Well, guess what? The food companies change. I mean, you know, it, and it's no, there's no discussion. Next topic. So it feels like you know, there's fully agree, consumers are not going to drive this, and the ANVR, so the Dutch Travel Agents Association, got very good data on this. So I think there's, there's two bits, there's a money bit and there's a regulation bit. So why is, what's stopping the regulators getting into it? And telling the story, I think the sorts of numbers that Chevy is sharing, that's interesting and most commonsensical people, wow, I had no idea. You know, so presenting some of that information, not in a shaming way, but just in, this is why we're doing it. The other bit, which I, neither of you might be interested, is the money bit. So the Dutch example is that the ANVR, to my knowledge, is the first European travel, outbound travel agency association, which is entertaining the idea that there should be a minimum or a sort of fair, fair, you know, so you shouldn't be able to fly from Amsterdam to Malaga for eight euros ninety-nine. Okay, that should just stop. Okay, that is going to get very spicy when the lobbyists get involved. But the question is, if the regulator decides move the floor, 
And then, you know, let's talk about what you do with the money, you know, and, and does that accelerate green tech? Does it, you know, what does it do? Um, I, I think that, so it's a sort of, what does the regulator do and what's the money? And just on the water, um, I think I'm right in saying in Andalusia, hotels are still allowed to fill swimming pools, but domestic, not. Yeah, so, so that's just dumb because it's increasing the antagonism between the visitor economy and, and, and residents in a really damaging way. So I think that just feels very clumsy to me. Uh, and you're going to accelerate the, you know, and antagonism is not a good place to develop policy because you end up with lots of short-term yeah. symbolic reactions. You've seen with the areas this week, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing is that we are not the entity doing the laws, but we have the National Committee of Responsible Tourism. Here you have 180 pages that tackle all these things, the water consumption, the electricity, but it's but that's it. Yeah, exactly. well, that's the point. But that's the first step. Yeah. And that's the yeah. But we don't have time. That's the yeah. point. So, so I think the real strong appeal for me is can we stop screwing around? Because the, we, we see endless documents. I, mean, I went to a UN Habitat, UN tourism thing about all this stuff in, in Bilbao two, three weeks ago. <laughs> and we get, yeah, we all agree this needs to happen. So the only way of requiring it is regulatory. You know, if, you can't have single-use plastics anymore. End of discussion. All right, we'll use potato starch, right? and that dry, and that drives investment in factories that make bags out of potato starch. But as long as we're in this kind of woolly, so talk to Miguel Sanz, and he's being an idiot if he's not saying change this because Spain needs a visitor economy. It really does. Um, and, and Catalonia, I think, is one of the most innovative regions in Europe, you know, and it does walk the walk from a product perspective. And given the level, I mean, I don't know exactly whether you can require hotels to do whatever, but, you know, use your power. Uh, and, and I think you'll be surprised to see, yeah, actually, they're getting on with it. So don't be shy, would be my... So I was interviewing the CEO of Sykes Cottages earlier on. They've got 4,000 cottages across the UK, and they basically said, we will no longer market to international tourists, we will only market to domestic, because the carbon footprint of domestic tourists is, on average, two and a half hours drive from home. The international tourist is ridiculous. We will provide um, better search engine optimization, you know, we'll premium people through the algorithm if they have sustainability criteria. So they'll come out much, much earlier in the search engine. And they will pay a lower commission for renting their property through us if they have sustainability criteria. And I'm like, wow. Now I know Booking.com, Airbnb, and uh, Expedia, Via, VRBO, and all the others I've talked to have said, no, it's illegal to do that. The algorithm cannot be touched for legal reasons. And the other companies say, yeah, rubbish. You just don't want to touch it, right? It would be too, too problematic. But equally, when you guys decide who, who to work with, do you give sufficient incentive to the sustainable companies to say, we'll work with you and only with you. And if you are not sustainable, we'll just stop working with you. Yeah, that, that's one thing that every time, step by step, we are considering. And we are doing, uh, when we, promote to the tourist uh, to the tour operators that okay. look for offer the first on the list okay. are the ones that step by step we are considering wow <laughs> like i was asking patrick this 10 years ago when both of us still had hair right you know it's like oh come on guys like do it now unless we do it quickly it's like asking my children would you like to voluntarily eat broccoli and not eat chocolate what do you think the answer is going to be? Step by step. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to change. We need to do it. And, and honestly, you may, I mean, you guys are in the position to say the only product we'll promote to the UK market are those that are genuinely acknowledged as being sustainable. And we are not going to promote anything else. Right? Marina Land should not be in your radar. Right? Anything that means dolphins in captivity should have been killed a long time ago, and so on. 
golf courses, they use more water. Mm -hmm. A golf course uses the water of 10,000 local inhabitants. We should not be promoting golf anymore. And cruise lines, we should have killed the idea of promoting cruise tourism a very long time ago. And I know that we, have, we don't own the port of Barcelona, but all these things should not be in our vocabulary anymore. That's true as well that tourism, as we said at the beginning, it will grow anyway. But what we can do from here, I guess, is yeah. to drive this to where we want or where it's possible for us. Yeah. But the other type of offer, they will, people on the street, they will request this offer. Yeah. So here we are to help them to drive to the correct ones or the ones that are. Uh, the more sustainable, and that's our work here. Yeah. Like, you know, the fact that even in the UK we now have a water emergency, and every business in the UK has been asked by asked by law to reduce their water consumption by twenty percent in the next five years. This is huge. Like, people don't think of the UK as a place with water shortages. It, it is now. We have a water deficit of billions of liters of water every year. Right. We have major problems with water in this country. And then if we go to Morocco, it's a different story, right? But come on, guys, this problem is not going away. Next year is going to be worse. That's the, the one guarantee we have is next year is going to be worse. So may I ask? I suppose the question arises whether can you see any difference? So, in the spirit of the conversations, I want to bring in the UK a little bit. Sure. So is there any difference in the UK being a tourism market which from the outside, from someone that is not in the sector, it is not as massified as somewhere like Barcelona, maybe London is a different story. So can you see any, is there any difference in how somewhere like Barcelona has to target these sustainability requirements or objectives? Does the UK, is the UK doing any work in this? And whether, is it the burden of only the mass no, destinations every, every destination to tackle this? Every, every destination has to improve. We, we no longer have the situation where we can say, somebody he can, somebody is exempt. Like we, we, all, we all have to move in the right direction. And then we have the whole conversation of climate justice. Right. So the people that will do the worst are the people that probably contribute to the least to the problem. It's always people in poverty who pay their highest price for everything. I know, I, I mean, we should have warned you, you'll need to be take Prozac after today. <laughs> right? You'll all be on, but... Yeah. Yes, oh. Yeah, so, no. Thank you. Um, so, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Yeah, okay. So, um, when we talk about tourism in Catalonia, an issue that is very much mentioned in the news and also mentioned by a lot of citizens, especially from the coastal areas, is the issue of party tourism and the fact that it's caused a lot of anger, a lot of residents that literally will leave their towns during summer because they want to avoid this tourism. Is there a world in which sustainable tourism is compatible with this party tourism? And if not, how can we change this mentality? Because obviously, like clubs might have to close, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is there like how can this transition happen from like mentality as well, like the part of tourism? Yeah. So go for it. Because it's the, yeah, the, yeah. the question about the destination. Uh, you may think in places like you know, the Bar or Salo. Uh, for how long have you not been there? It's changed. Um, how many years? In like Yoretan, this area, yeah. since I was born. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, uh, since yeah. before the pandemic, these uh, yeah, destinations, yeah. Uh, they are working very hard in promoting a different type of yeah. tourism. So, they are focusing in sports tourism. Groups of people that they will stay one week, ten days training and enjoying the destination. And also, bikes or business trips, uh, tourism. Who uh, they stay for longer. So, uh, this misconception that we have about Barcelona being over tourism, uh, or the destinations like this with the, with the old type of tourism, and I guess in Catalonia we have done a very hard job to change that uh, idea 
and to change the perception or, or the type of offer that uh, they, they are considering. Uh, I always invite people who ask for this to go back to your end and to see what's happening down in May, in your end the bar or in the Yeah, no, it's, it's changed substantially. Yeah. But, but, but those tourists have now moved to Croatia. <laughs> so they haven't gone away yeah, altogether, so but they just, just moved somewhere else. They just change the place they go to. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the drinking culture, you know, finishing a levels and going drinking, drinking is still there. And the problem is what comes from that, right? It's not only like the fact of like consuming alcohol and partying, but it's the the contamination that comes from that, the littering, the beaches, the everything that comes with that. So. That's probably it, right? We're going to go I think so. Thank you very much, Xavier, for always giving us reasons to work harder. To give us more work to do. Happy to help. Well, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much.